We'll look at the newest treatment of management of diabetes later in our health segment. But first tonight, the scandal in the CIA. Standing by with the mayor of Baltimore, Yolanda. What do you think of this proud moment for the city of Baltimore? It's beautiful. I love the energy down here. There's so many people down here. BMW as they celebrate ramped up vehicle production at their U.S. assembly plant while issuing a major recall on one of their most popular compact nameplates. Americans will spend close to $1.7 billion, and that's right with a B, <laughs> on flowers for their loved ones. Since then, they've grown a strong presence here in Maryland. In fact, you're looking at an art class that's going on right here in Howard County. Rising gasoline prices are also renewing interest in another alt fuel, compressed natural gas. Students here at the University of Maryland say any increase is difficult in a tough economy. And in other news, Chrysler is working with the Department of Energy to evaluate the practicality of plug-in hybrid electric technology. While pay-by-phone parking apps are the latest technology available to consumers, Graziani says parking solutions may become so advanced that these meters could become obsolete. You could call it a case of mid-size misfortune, as several of the world's top-selling luxury cars are slammed with substandard crash test results. Mike Gorski, it was a pleasure. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having me. No, we appreciate that. All thank right. you so much. And if you'd like to find out more information about Wegmans, just log on to our website at mpt.com org and click on your money in business. All right, Jeff, that'll wrap it up here from Hunt Valley. Now back to you in the studio. In just a moment, we'll talk with retired Colonel Cedric Layton, who has spent decades as a military intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. But first, I spoke earlier today with Maryland Congressman Dutch Ruppersberger, who was in the room when former CIA Director General David Petraeus testified last week on Capitol Hill. He was a very beaten down man. Uh, there's a lot going on. He's working through his issues with his family. But the, the sad thing, it also is, is not good for the United States because here was a brilliant person who not only knew the military side, but the intelligence side. But I want to get back to Attorney General Eric Holder specifically said that throughout their investigation, they did not find anything with the Petraeus situation that posed a national threat. If that's in fact the case, then why did James Clapper ask that he resign? Well, two things possibly come to mind. First of all, one of them would be that that may not be the whole story yet. You know, Congressman Ruppersberger said that he felt the Petraeus investigation went through the proper channels at the right time uh, and the right people were notified, although he did say something to the effect that he wished Congress had known a little sooner. Um, but do you feel that way? Because from the outside looking in, I just am very, very confused. I mean, you've got this FBI guy who's getting information from Jill Kelly, who's then going. It's almost as if Jill Kelly didn't tip everybody off. Petraeus would probably still be the CIA director today. Oh, probably so, absolutely, unless something else happened, another shoe dropped, as it were. Uh, but Yolanda, you, you, uh, you know, you're right that uh, there are certain questions about the timeline here. What can you say of his legacy? We've got about 30 seconds left. Will this last scandal be the thing that tarnishes his legacy, or will all the work that he's done previous still stand out? Well, I think in part the work will stand out, but this legacy, his legacy is tarnished quite a bit by two factors, not only the scandal, but also the inconclusive nature of the Afghan war. We appreciate that. And coming up, the latest treatments for diabetes. We're back in just a moment. For Nyree Williams, shooting hoops comes natural to her. I can be who I am and do what I want to do, and you know, and on the court. And even though she's only 20 years old, this redshirt junior from Towson University knows the significance of Title IX. As a female basketball player, it just means that we get the same opportunity as the men do, and we're not slighted in any way. Williams and her teammates have made great progress under Title IX legislation. In fact, the number of young women involved in high school and collegiate sports has increased over the last 40 years, a point that's not lost on sports legend Billie Jean King. There's more than 54 percent of women enrolled in universities uh, and colleges, and that's because of Title IX. King, a pro tennis player who pushed for gender equity in the late 60s and 70s, tells me while those numbers are promising, there's still more work that needs to be done. In high school, girls still uh, have 1.3 million fewer opportunities in sports uh, than boys. Uh, so we have a ways to go. Uh, we still get less money in scholarships. We don't have enough women coaches in college. And Title IX is not without controversy. Some male athletes claim they're losing out on opportunities because of the law and the way it's being enforced. 
I want to ask you if you think that there are some valid concerns on behalf of male athletes who say, look, because of Title IX, our programs are being cut. And we're talking about the minor sports, like swimming and gymnastics and wrestling. Do no, they have a valid case? that's not true. Not true? No. Driving while intoxicated. It became an all too familiar routine for Audra Johnston. And I can remember just holding on to the steering wheel going, man, there's got to be more to life than this. She received her first DWI at age 21. With nothing more than a slap on the wrist, Johnston continued her drunk driving ways. Up until my third DWI, I really did not care. And I think unless you're an alcoholic, you're not going to understand it. After her third offense, Johnston was given the option to participate in an ignition interlock program. This is where a company authorized by the state installs a breath analyzer device that looks somewhat like a cell phone into a person's vehicle to test their blood alcohol content before they drive. LifeSafer State Director Bill Chastain demonstrates the breath test. Once it goes to blow, you can go ahead and take the test. Okay. Chastain says there's a certain way you must blow into the device for it to record the proper blood alcohol content level, making it difficult for just anyone to do it. All of the breath tests and other pertinent information are recorded. The participant must bring in their vehicle every month to transfer the information from the ignition interlock device to a computer. That data download is sent to the state's Motor Vehicle Administration for review. MVA Deputy Administrator Chrissy Neiser says if they find any violations, and there's a long list of them, they'll extend the program by a month for each violation. So it's to try to teach them that, look, this is, we have to change your behavior to make you a safe driver again. Every state has some type of ignition interlock requirement, and some states, like New York, make it mandatory for first-time offenders. While these in-car breathalyzers are a great technological tool in the fight against drunk drivers, Neiser warns they're not a cure-all. I hated it. The interlock was the pain in the butt that I had. You know, it was the money, it was the inconvenience of going and every month. Johnston tried every trick in the book to avoid blowing into the device. Once off the program, she received her fourth DWI at age 39 and spent 17 days in jail. It was a wake-up call for her destructive behavior. I had to hit my bottom before I finally said, okay, I'm done. This Ford Escape hybrid, decked out with fancy decals and high-tech equipment, may look like some top-secret vehicle, but for Mark Riccobono, it represents the first step towards unlimited mobility for blind people. This is just one example of our guys saying, this is important, this is meaningful, this is going to change how people think about blindness. For the past several months, Riccobono and his colleagues from the National Federation of the Blind have been testing out the prototype vehicle. As they test what seems to be an impossible notion, can a blind person drive a car? A lot of people say, oh, these people in the National Federation of the Blind, they're nuts. And yet, now we have another prototype. We're doing exciting things for blind people, which will have spin-off possibilities for everybody else. Pork engineers and students from Romola, the Robotics and Mechanisms Lab, equip the vehicle with laser scanners in the front and back to detect objects in the road, mounted cameras on the windshield to identify different lanes, a GPS antenna, and an inertial measurement unit that, when combined, paints a 3D picture of the driving environment. All this information is sent to an onboard computer to be processed. It's conveyed to the driver in real time using two non-visual user interfaces. The first one is called Drive Grip. These are specially designed gloves with vibrating motors that tell the driver which way to steer. The second device is a speed strip, which looks like a seat cushion. It has four pairs of vibrating motors in the back and legs to signal rate of speed information. Four years in the making and it all boils down to this one moment. Engineers say they're pretty confident that this technology-laden vehicle can handle the course. Now it's up to the driver to see it through. Here at the famed Daytona International Speedway, Rick Abono readies himself for the public unveiling of the Blind Driver Challenge. Check, 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 can you hear me? The 34-year-old offers up a final wave as he begins to navigate the course. Relying on the drive grip and speed strip, Rick Abono makes his way around the 1.5-mile track. He hits a top speed of 27 miles per hour, but there are challenges that test his abilities. A box toss he must maneuver his way through and a moving pass. It takes less than 10 minutes to complete the course. 
First ever blind driver at Daytona. Rick Abono crosses the finish line with the steely determination of a blind man on a mission. Very fulfilling that the, the vision of the National Federation of the Blind, that we've finally been able to put it out in the public and demonstrate the capacity of blind people in driving.